Lord, we thank you that today, in every season, every situation, we can say, blessed be your name. We can stand upon your faithfulness and say, Lord God, you never change. Every day, every hour, every minute, you are the same. And your faithfulness, like the stars of the sky, remains. Thank you that today we have a foundation on which to stand. A hope in which to trust. A love that holds tight onto our lives. And we pray, Lord, that as we open up your word to, together now, that by your spirit, Lord, you would come and speak. We pray that by your spirit, you would open our eyes and soften our hearts to hear your word. Your word which remains true through all eternity. Come, Lord, we pray and speak into our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you all. Um, thanks for joining us here and at home. I'm glad you're here. We are continuing our journey in the book of Joshua today. If you're joining us for the first time, Joshua is a book of the Old Testament. And it's a book that tells the, the historical story of God's people Israel coming into the promised land, the, the land that God had promised to Abraham their forefather. It's a story that more than anything else tells us one thing and that is this, God is faithful in hard times and in easy times. When life just feels so tough and when it feels like it's going swimmingly, God is faithful and from season to season his faithfulness never ever changes. And so today we're going to be dipping into Joshua chapter 13 and thinking a little bit about the chapters to come. Time goes fast, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but this last year just seems to have gone at a rate of knots. I mean, once we get back to some kind of normality, and the whole church gathers again in this building, we're going to see kids who are no longer kids, but who are kind of taller than us. You know, the the year's gone quickly, time has flown by, we're not even going to recognize some people when we get back together again properly. And as time goes by, I don't know about you, but you tend to forget things. You forget little things, um, like dates and maybe birthdays. And you forget big things, like why are we here? What really makes life matter and mean something? Where does joy come from? All these things that... As life carries on so quickly and you're on the roller coaster of life, you forget where you started and why you're here and what life is really for. We're about to see that in the book of Joshua. Because Joshua's story is fast paced. And all of a sudden, we've flicked through a few chapters and years have passed. It's like someone's pressed the fast forward button in Joshua's life skipping through. And now we come to chapter 13. We've seen mighty kingdoms defeated in the previous few chapters. And we meet Joshua again in chapter 13, only he's grown. He's not like we remember him. He's got old. That happens, doesn't it? And you, you, know, when, you know when you haven't seen someone for a long time, maybe you've had Facebook and you've met up with a school friend on there who you hadn't seen since you were in school years ago. And you look at their photo and you think, wow, the years haven't been kind to you. Have you ever, ever thought that? They're probably thinking the same thing back at you, by the way. Wow, the years haven't been kind to you. Time has happened. Well, that's going to happen now in chapter 13 of Joshua. The time has disappeared. And as the years passed... Here's the question. What's God's plan for you? Is he still calling you? Let's read, shall we? Joshua chapter 13. I'm going to read the first seven verses, but we may dip into a few other verses as well. Now, Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you're old and advanced in years. And there remains yet very much land to possess. This is the land that yet remains all the regions of the Philistines, and all those of the Geshurites, from Shehor, which is east of Egypt, 
northwards to the boundary of Ekron. It's counted as Canaanite. And there are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, and those of the Avim. In the south, all the land of the Canaanites and Mira that belonged to the Sidonians, to Aphek, to the boundary of the Amorites, and the land of the Gebelites and all Lebanon towards the sunrise from Baal Gad below Mount Hermon to Libo Hamath. All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Misrepho Maim, even all the Sidonians. I, myself, will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Only allot the land to Israel for inheritance as I've commanded you. Now therefore divide this land for inheritance to the nine tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. That's one of those readings you kind of dread a little bit because it's got so many um, words and names that you don't immediately recognize. <clears throat> Secret insider tip here, if you're ever reading one of those lists, speak confidently and no one will ever know any different. <laughs> I, I, there are a few things I, I want to bring out of this this morning that I think God might be speaking to you. And maybe just one of them will find an anchor in your soul and take root today. Maybe four things I think that will jump out as we read through. The first is this. God is still calling Joshua. I love verse 1. Joshua was old and advanced in years. And God says to him, you're old and advanced in years. Don't you love that? There's absolutely no pretending with God. He sees through the, the younger looking clothes and the makeup and the hair dye. He sees through all our pretense, all of it. No one can come before the throne of God and say, hey, I'm better than I really am. He sees through it all. Even when we don't, and even when we've got our, ourselves convinced that we're somehow better than we are, He sees through it all. He sees through the pretense of religiousness and moral appearance. He sees through the pretense that everything's okay. He sees through it all. And even as God speaks to Joshua, he's calling him into a kind of reality. And this morning, I wonder if for some of us, God wants to bring us into a reality check. Both as you come before God, and I want to say a little bit more about that in a moment, but with each other as well. I had a, a hugely challenging quote this week from an um, American pastor called Ray Ortland. He said, something amazing happens in the church when we kind of get past small talk and really start to bear our souls to our family, to our church. He said this, when that happens, we stop playing church and we enter into real fellowship. And that's the kind of place where healing and restoration takes place. We're called to be real people, you know. And so, anyway, God says to Joshua, I know you're old. I know you've come through life and you've faced all these battles and you bear all of these scars. I know it all. Joshua is old. And maybe you feel something of his weariness this morning. Maybe you wouldn't say I'm old, but you would say I'm weary. Maybe you feel it. Maybe you feel you've had enough. And the temptation in the midst of weariness or sorrow or sickness is to say, let's just focus on me. It's time for me time now. Time to retreat from the world. And what Joshua <clears throat> is about to hear is this. The very best thing he can do is not retreat from the world and take an early retirement. <clears throat> the very best thing he can do is look to the Lord. Trust in Him with all that He is. Don't retreat. For you and I, as we do that, we'll find God isn't finished with us. That He's not done with you. That He is still calling you just as He did Joshua. Look at verse 1 again. Yes, Joshua, you're old and advanced in years. But listen, but there's still so much more to do. God says to Joshua, I know you're weak. And you think maybe your work is done, but it's not. There is so much more to do. Whatever you might say to yourself today, God will speak to you like he did to Joshua and say, you're old, that's okay. You're poor, sure, that's fine. 
You're unconfident, that's all right. You're fearful, you're ill, you're worried, you're timid, you're disappointed, you're dispassionate, you've lost your passion. Okay, God says to you, but there is so much more to do, he says to Joshua. And this is how God speaks to us. In the midst of real life and our human brokenness and weakness, God says to you, I know what is happening in your life, but look, I am calling you. You know, think of Peter. He did it to him, didn't he? It's like Jesus said to Peter, I know you're a denier. Feed my sheep. And he says that to you and I too. And I want to talk maybe to some of you this morning who have felt particular disappointments in life. Maybe you once knew that kind of youthful enthusiasm for the Lord and somewhere you lost it. Maybe you can think back to a moment when you were passionate about your faith. When you just couldn't stop talking about it. And you were excited about what God had in store for your life. But somewhere down the line, you just kind of gave in. You took an early retirement from following Christ. Well, here's the news. Just like with Joshua, God didn't give in. And he didn't change. And he is still calling you today. And his word to you, much like with Joshua and Peter, is the still work to do. I'm still calling you. And you see it again and again and again through the pages of the Bible, don't you? God takes people who who feel they've come to the end of the line. Takes people who feel they've failed one too many times takes people who feel they're just too weary and too broken and he says I'm calling you by name there's still work for you to do and that is true for you there is nothing in your past or present that disqualifies you from God using you nothing that says he can't call you nothing he's calling your name this morning now What God does next as he speaks to Joshua, what um, the rest of chapter 13 does really is to list a whole load of enemies. And so all the way down from verse 2 to verse 6, there's just a list of mighty enemies, which by the way is a shorter list than the enemies that have been conquered so far, but it's still a pretty daunting list for anyone, let alone for an old man. but God calls the old man. And the question is this, for you and for I and for Joshua, why should you and I hear the call of God on our lives today? Why listen at all? Why give up comfort? Why give up his retirement? Well, out of that come three things, really. First one is this. God's promises have not changed one tiny bit, even if Joshua has. He may have gone grey and got a beard. He may be balding. He may be knowing a whole host of the symptoms of old age. But God hasn't changed one bit. Not a bit. His promises haven't changed one bit. By the way, if you're listening to this series and you're kind of listening through and you're thinking, I think you're just saying the same thing every week in a slightly different way. You're absolutely right. I am. Because that's the book of Joshua. Every chapter, every verse cries out, God made a promise and he will keep it to the end of time and he will never fail it, ever. And this is the rock on which we build our lives. God's unfailing promise never fails. That's why we're coming back to the same theme every single week because there isn't a page of the Bible on which that theme is not written. There's nowhere else for us to build our lives than on this rock of God keeping his promises, and he's done it in Jesus Christ, and there we build today. Just look at this, verse 6. God says, there's still work for you to do. He lists this long list of enemies, verse 6, but look, I myself would drive them out from before the people of Israel. I'm going to do it, only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance as I've commanded you. Do you you hear what God's saying to Joshua? He's saying, look, I'm going to do it. All you've got to do is kind of write down who gets what. I mean, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? I'm no general, but I'm pretty sure this is a pretty sure battle plan. God says, I'm going in front, and the job will be done. 
If you know anything about ancient battles, the front line was the brutal and most dangerous place to be. The timid, the cowards would hide at the back and the most brave and strong would be at the front. And God says, Joshua, I'm still calling you, but I will face your enemies. I will bear the scars for you. I will carry the weight that you cannot carry into your battle. Just follow me. Honestly, for each one of us this morning, there is no surer course for our lives than to choose the tough and challenging path of following Christ. Uh, And yes, it might mean surrender, and it might mean sacrifice, and it may well mean going into battle, but it also means certain victory. Jesus said, he he who would save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will surely save. To you today, God calls your name. To you today, God says again, I'm not done with you. There is much work to do and I go ahead of you into the battle. Just keep close to me and follow me. But as he calls Joshua, and Joshua goes on to do exactly what God said, which is to divide up the land. I mean, what what a great job. I'm going to do the work here. You just divide out the land. But as he does that, we learn some deeply troubling warnings that Israel didn't hear and we must. God gives them a warning. For the rest of this chapter, and in fact all the way to chapter 19, Joshua details how the land was, now here's the word, possessed, not conquered. That's the word that gets used again and again and again. There's much land yet to possess. Why is God saying that? Well, he's just repeating the same thing. He's saying, I'm going to do it. You've just got to live in it. Just live in the land that I give to you. Isn't that our calling? Isn't that what faith is? It's to live in the promises of God. It's to live in the reality of his presence. It's to live in the abundance of his, abundance of his love and kindness and provision. Look, Israel... I'm going to do it and I'm going to give it to you. You just live in the land as my people. Here's the warning. All the way down through to chapter 19, there are hidden multiple warnings. You see, the big victories have been won. The mighty kings have been overthrown. Now Israel get to relax in their warm houses. And the temptation is real. Especially for the people that have already got their land. If you can just imagine a map of Israel, remember from last week, the the middle has been conquered, and now, slowly and surely, the rest has been as well. And there are just kind of small areas around the edges that aren't yet won. Most people have got their homes, their lands, and they can start to settle down. But their calling isn't to settle down. It's not the dream that God has given to Israel just yet. And you can almost hear their voices saying, do we really want to go into battle when we've got a home that's warm and a nice sofa? Do we really want to go into battle? And so this happens. Glance down to verse 13. Yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Markathites, but Geshur. And Markath dwell in the midst of Israel to this day. They just couldn't quite be bothered to hear the call of the Lord. There's much work left to do, Israel. Well, actually, we're quite content to sit on our sofas in the warm. We got far enough and we don't want to go any further that the spirit of people who really believe in the heart of God's promises. They defeated their main opponents and they got to a place where they just thought, this is fine, this is good enough. And God says, finish the work, Israel. It happens a few times. And the warning for God's people is, don't get complacent. Don't disbelieve my promises because ultimately that's what's going on. You read down to chapter 15, verse 63. When it happens again, it says that they could not defeat their enemies. Why? 
But they'd given up believing that God goes into battle for them. They'd given up following him into battle. And so what happens is there are enemies in their midst and they let them remain. And you read it thinking, come on Israel, God's still calling you. Tell the nations about Yahweh. Maybe they'll be like Rahab and they'll turn to him. Finish the work, Israel. Don't get discouraged. Don't get complacent. But you and I know just how easy it is to grow complacent in this world. A world that is always telling us, just live your best life now. A world that is forever telling us, just relax on that nice comfy sofa in your living room. This year, more than ever before, we're feeling that, aren't we? Just stay in your home Let's hope that doesn't set into our souls for the rest of our lives. We must battle against it. The call as I read through these chapters and the warning is don't get complacent because the temptation to settle is real. Maybe you're wondering, do I really want to go into battle? I really want to hear that call of Jesus Christ again calling me by name, saying, I've still got work for you to do. Take up your cross and follow me. Do I really want to go? Maybe you're even asking, does it really matter? And this is the heart of it. I mean, I think they were probably asking this very question. Does it really matter if the Geshurites are ruled by us or not, or if they're just doing their own thing in this land of covenants? It doesn't really matter, does it? And clearly it didn't matter to them, but oh, it would matter. When the idols of the Geshurites started to be taken on by the people of God, it would matter. When the people of God turned away from the living God to idols made by men, it would matter. See, in these days of Joshua, when they just seemed like a minor issue, nothing big to worry about, they couldn't ever foresee that what started as a small act of disobedience would turn into something horrendous. I wonder if you've experienced that in your life. I know I have on numerous occasions. What starts as a small wandering away from God just eventually multiplies. And you see it in lives that are ruined. Christians that throw everything away and it all begins with tiny, tiny Little acts of complacency. Oh, how the church's temptation is to think, this doesn't matter so much. What God's calling me to, it's kind of, I'll I'll do it one day, it doesn't matter now. It's not an immediate concern. What really matters is my job and my health and coronavirus and my family and all that obviously matters Eternal life matters so much more. Don't grow complacent in the calling upon your life, Joshua. Don't grow complacent on the calling on your life, people of Jesus Christ. Well, from there, Joshua then takes us from chapter 13 into seven chapters detailing the inheritance of Israel. And you might read it and think, gosh, that's hard work. It's like reading the land registry or the yellow pages of ancient Israel. And in some ways, it really is like that. That's kind of exactly what it is. It's a list of who's who and where they were and and whose land they possessed. That's what it is. And yet, it will be the timeless record of God's faithfulness to his people throughout all generations. His faithfulness to family after family after family. And they will look back and they will say, my great, great, great grandfather came into the land that wasn't his and God gave him this land. You see, God has promised that the land would belong to Israel forever. Passed as an inheritance from one generation to another. And... Don't miss this. With the encouragement to hear God calling Joshua, carry on Joshua. And the warning not to grow complacent. There is this hint of a glorious glimpse of what God really offers to his people. If you were to ask me today, why is it worth you taking up your cross and following Jesus Christ? Here's how I would answer you. 
Because what God offers to you and to them is more than gifts. It's more than faithfulness. Look at verse 33 of chapter 13. We've just gone through a list of who gets what. And there's one tribe amongst Israel. Remember there are 12 families. We call them tribes of Israel. And there's one tribe that is going to get nothing. No land whatsoever. Verse 33, but to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, just as he said to them. I wonder how you react to that. This is an inheritance, so it's, a, it's, a, it's thought of a little bit like a will. When someone dies, they leave in, in their will an inheritance to many people. I don't know if you've ever sat in on the reading of a will and all the different details that are given out to people are, are, are mentioned. How would you feel if you were Levi? Oh yeah, Judah, they get that nice big plot of land in the south. Great for vineyards, olive trees. Levi, you get nothing. Oh no, you do. You get the Lord God of Israel. I wonder how you would feel if that was you. But here's the secret God is letting his people in on. They don't get an inheritance. Why? Because they get the best gift of all. The Lord God himself is their inheritance. And look, if we understand what's going on here, it is a world-changing perspective for our lives. Because in fact, the promise that God gives to the tribe of Levi is the promise that comes down to the church. You know what Peter says we are? We're a royal priesthood. What do priests get? They don't get vineyards and olive groves. They get the Lord God Himself. This is our promise through Jesus Christ. We get God Himself. And that can change our perspective on everything. You know, the tribe of Levi had nothing to lose. And neither do we. Isn't that a perspective that fires us up and says, yes, God is calling us to go and follow him wherever he leads us and I've got nothing to lose because he himself is our inheritance. David gets it in the Psalms. He says, you're my inheritance. You're my portion in the land of the living. Nothing else, just you. You're it for me. And he's the king and he could have the kingdom, but he says, no, God, you're my inheritance. Those believers in the book of Hebrews who the writer says they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. Why? Because they knew they had a better and an abiding possession. What? God! He was their possession. They had nothing to lose. I recognize this though. On a Sunday morning in church that rolls off my tongue far more easily than maybe we feel it in our hearts. Isn't that true? Maybe for you this morning, you'd say, yes, I totally agree with that, but what if my car breaks down tomorrow morning? What if my house gets repossessed? What if I lose my job for speaking about Jesus Christ? Is he really a better inheritance than all of that and that is just the battle of faith that the tribe of Levi are facing is he really is he really here's the truth there is a glimpse in this of all that God would eventually offer completely to his people through Jesus more than his gifts he offers himself Look, the God who calls you today and says there is more to do, says to you, I give you myself. And there is nothing more that I can give than that. Friends, I, I don't know how you look at the cross of Calvary, the cross of Christ. I don't know what you think is going on there. But here's what the Bible says is happening. God is giving himself for you forever, forever, saying I will never leave you or ever forsake you and you can't lose. We talk about Joshua, 
the leader of the book of Joshua, but as you know, there is another Joshua in the Bible. Joshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. Jesus is just a kind of Latinized version of Joshua. There is another Joshua in the book of the Bible. Another one who leads his people into difficult circumstances, but always promises victory. And he is with you. And he brings all the fullness and reality and beauty and majesty of God into your life and says, I will never, ever leave you. Maybe this morning you're going through difficulties, but you can still look up and say, he's still calling my name. And there is still work to do. And he goes with me. We're going to respond in just a moment. And I don't know if you want to start leading us in that. But as we start to respond, for some of you this morning, it just feels like the difficulties you're facing obliterate everything else. I mean, right now they just seem so big and everything else seems so small. Today God is calling each one of us to a change of perspective to see the reality of God with us. To see what it really means to have Him as our inheritance. Everything else in our lives one day will no longer be ours, but He will be for all eternity. Doesn't that shape and change your perspective? Today, in the midst of difficulties, you can still look up and say, He is calling me. You know, there's a beautiful image to the backdrop of all of this. You remember last week I talked about a place called Shechem. It's a significant place in, in the story of Israel coming into the land. It's where God first promised to Abraham that he would be to Abraham and his offspring, God. It's the place where God promised to Abraham a land and a people. It's the place where, again, Joshua causes all of Israel to line up and he speaks blessings upon them. And I just wonder if in that place Joshua ever looked up and saw the stars in the sky. You know, I love this. Do you remember the illustration God gave to Abraham? He told him that he would give him many, many, many offspring. That his offspring would be like a nation, mighty, as numerous as, as what? The stars in the sky. You know, Joshua would look up at the same sky and he would say, these are the same stars that my ancestor Abraham looked at. Just the same. Every night the same stars come out and there they are, unchanging in their splendor and glory. In Joshua's day, just the same as in Abraham's day. You know, we can look up and see just the same stars that Abraham looked at, unchanging in the sky. Why did God make that promise? Well, I can only imagine it's so that every generation could look up and see a living illustration of God's faithfulness. Of God saying, I am here and my promises are there if only you will trust in me. Friends, we have been brought into the same promises of Abraham. We're heirs of the promise, the Bible says. And maybe you are going through difficulties today, but look up and see the magnitude of the promises that God has made to you. To be with you and to call your name. He's not done with you. He's calling you again. And nothing in your past or present disqualifies you. Maybe you bow your head with me for a moment. Just um, before the service, just as I was praying, Nick sent me um, a word that God had put on our heart and, and it is so right for this morning. And for some of you, I, this, this may well just be a key that unlocks the, the hurt and the brokenness and enables you to just start to find healing and hope in the God of promise. He says this to you. You can trust me with that area that you've buried deep within you. 
from the hurt and the wrong that you felt and are frightened to deal with. It's okay to be honest. The time has come to allow him in. To be real and admit that a part of you has been broken and you've been hiding. God is longing to set you free. God could say to Joshua, you're old and advanced in years. And he can say to you, I know what's going on. Just be real about it. Just come to me in all honesty and whatever your struggles, whatever the battles you're facing, just come and be open. I'm calling your name. Come. To some of you now, just as, as Anne sings, this is a moment for you to come before him and say, Lord, this is who I am. And, and maybe it'll come with weeping and maybe it'll come with pain as you first open up to him but it is worth coming down that road. To some others this morning, you, you felt something when I said some of you have given up. And you, you really felt that. Somewhere down the road of following Christ, you just kind of gave up and became half-hearted. Somehow you grew complacent and somehow you stopped fighting the battle and somehow you just said it doesn't really matter. And he says to you, no, this matters so much. I'm calling your name. Follow me. But to all of us today, God is saying, I'm the promise. Don't come to me just for what I can do. I am the promise. I'm the gift. And I'm here that you might delight in relationship with me. Let's come, shall we? Anne's going to lead us. Just as she does, maybe, maybe you, you want to stay seated and just bow your head and delight in Him. Maybe you want to respond to some of those things that He's speaking to you in today. Maybe you want to stand and join Him. However you respond, let's be honest and open and real before the one who knows our souls this morning. Help me now to live. 
worthy in every circumstance and every situation to be praised. And that, Lord, you would occupy our hearts. That, Lord, you would occupy every corner of our heart, that there won't be parts of our heart that we just think, oh, well, that doesn't matter. But that, Lord, we would give it all to you because you are worthy. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There have been some wonderful tires coming in, uh, reminding us of different ways that we can keep going. I love Ben has said he can keep praying, and he can keep helping, and he can keep caring, and he can keep Bible reading. And uh, Bianca has said, with God's help, I will never give up. I can always be good. Oh, it's a big call, that is, Bianca. I can always be good, and I won't get distracted at home. Brilliant. At school, rather than at home. I won't get distracted at school. And we've got, I will trust God with my future, my school, my friends. I'll ignore the distractions of my phone and my iPad. And scrams, is it? Scrams? Don't know. And I will, oh, screens, screens, okay. And I will never give up. Brilliant. Love that one as well. Morris says, Brilliant. Is that Morris's? That was a Rosie. Well done, Rosie. Love that one. Uh, Aaron's got, I will look up to Jesus and never give up. Brilliant, Aaron. Love that. And Esther's, I will set goals and not give up. I'll look up to Jesus. Brilliant. Great reminders that we can keep going. And just as Tom uh, was talking, I was reminded uh, Fanny Crosby was an American uh, hymn writer and she was blind. She was often quoted of saying, um, if I had a choice, I would still choose to remain blind. For when I die, the first face I will ever see will be the face of my blessed Savior. And just her uh, trust there and her joy to say, you can take the world, you can take the beauty of the world. My eyes are on the beauty of the Savior. And she wrote this hymn. The last verse says, take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be, till with clearer, brighter vision, face to face, my Lord, I see. What a great reminder there that, that today we can know the joy of Jesus and one day the glory of being face to face with our blessed Savior. Fanny Crosby got that, didn't she? Take the world, give me Jesus. And what a great cry for us today to say with Joshua, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep our eyes on the cross and know that he is with us. So shall we pray as we come to close? Lord, we just echo the words of this hymn. Take the world, but give me Jesus, and in his cross my trust shall be. Lord, we thank you for the cross. Thank you for such mercy and grace and love. Thank you that because of the cross, we can say, Lord, that we are a royal priesthood, that you have chosen us, you have welcomed us, you have made us your own, and that we can say our inheritance is Christ himself. Lord, thank you for the glory of the cross. And let us put our trust in that this week with the hope, Lord, that one day we will be able to say as well, face to face with my Savior I will be. Lord, thank you for that blessed truth, that eternal hope, and all that we have in Jesus. Lord, we just say with Kids Club, we're not going to give up. We're going to keep going, and we're going to look up and keep our eyes on Jesus. For your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this week online. We will be back as normal next week at 11. Have a great week. your eyes to heaven see the holy one eternal behold the lord of majesty exalted in his temple as symphonies of angels praise now strain to sound his glory fall before his grace the king in all his beauty how worthy how worthy how worthy the king in all
Later shame and splinters The sad